Okay, let me share my screen. And get forward. Welcome everyone. Uh, today we're going to have a clinical knee anatomy seminar talk by Parashkesh Natchev from UCL on the use and the misuse of uh, lesion mapping. Now, Natchev is a uh, quite world famous scientist and clinician these days who developed um, novel use of lesion mapping, and we're going to hear a lot about it as we go along. Hang on. Where's my mouse? Here we go. Um, for those of you who are new to the clinical neuroanatomy seminars, the seminars have been running for over 10 years, and we now develop novel formats such as the CNS Talk, the CNS Movie, the CNS Debate, CNS Comms, and Neurochino. Neurochino is uh, every Monday, 10 a.m. Grab a coffee, bring a paper, and have a chat with us. You can follow us on Twitter and on YouTube. We are also live streaming to YouTube at the moment, and you will have a recording of this talk later on. Now, let me first start by saying thank you to Henrietta House, who has recently moved on to a new position with Nature Communications and has left our team for now. But we welcome Lauren Thibault as a replacement, and she will be leading the Q&A after the talk. So if you have questions, please write them in the chat box or directly to Lauren. The rest of the team you can see on the right here is myself, Michelle Thibault de Schotten and Ahmed Bey in London, who are running in the background and also Victor, who's managing the YouTube channel for us. Now, before we start, I just want to go quickly through the rules. Um, we expect the questions and your comments to be respectful and constructive, fair-minded and well-rounded. Um, please do ask your questions or make comments in the chat box or send it directly to uh, Lauren. Throughout the talk and during the Q&A, we ask you to mute your mic, but you can keep your videos on. It's quite nice to see people whilst you talk and interact, um, but that is up to you as well. But please do mute your mics. Um, as I said, you can find us on Twitter and on YouTube. And just so you know, the next event is going to be a movie screening. And the movie is The Fifth Dementia, and that's going to happen on the 22nd of October at 4 p.m. Uh, as always. Now today, as I already said, we're going to have a talk on the use and misuse of in silico lesion deficit mapping. But before we go into the talk, I quickly want to get a flavor of who's in the room. And for those of you who have been with us previously, you already know this. We're going to have a quick poll. So let me launch it. And you should be able to see the poll appear on your screens now. And I'm going to give you a minute just to fill those questions in and then share the results with you. So if you could just take a minute and answer those questions, please. Oh, people are shy today. Can you all see the poll? Interesting, that has never happened before. Okay, we're not sharing today, apparently. <laughs> so in the absence of results on the poll, um, I'm gonna give the floor directly to you uh, and you can launch with your talk, over to you. Thank you very much. Well, um, I hope there'll be more questions than poll participants, um, but uh, let's, let's see. So let me just share my screen. And we can launch into our discussion. So the subject of my talk is the use and misuse of in silico lesion deficit mapping. So perhaps I should begin by clarifying what is really meant by in silico mapping here. What we're talking about is models, hypothetical models of the relation between a lesion and a deficit, where at least part of the model is synthetic, which is to say that it is a, um, it is a simulation experiment where some feature of the model 
is extraneously supplied. It's not dependent on actual data that we observe, but it's something that we can manipulate and control. And um, we will see why it's important that we think about using this technique when it comes to lesion deficit mapping as we go along. Now, the first thing to say is that there is something very disturbing about the task of lesion deficit mapping, which is that on the surface, it looks very simple. It looks as if it's something that's very easy to do. And in fact, it looks for many as if we could simply borrow technology that's been developed for other brain mapping purposes, such as functional imaging, and apply it to the task of building lesion deficit maps. In reality, there are a few tasks in neuroscience that are harder than lesion deficit mapping. And the fact that it looks simple, it merely appears simple, is a major handicap because it means that we then suffer what neurologists call the nosognosia. We're not aware of the fact that we actually don't know that what we're doing is wrong. And now maybe that should be the obligatory mention of COVID-19 in that the nosognosia is the lesion map is COVID-19. I won't make any more references to that harm illness, but there we are, we have it out of the way. Now, why, why is lesion deficit mapping so difficult? Well, actually, it's because it is so powerful. So remember that one of the main strengths of lesion deficit maps is that they're inferentially much stronger than any kind of correlative technique. Let's imagine that we were to build a simple truth table like this, where we have two techniques. One is correlative, such as function imaging. Another is disruptive, such as lesion deficit mapping and we were to have some kind of conflict between the two. Well, clearly a correlative signal might merely be a correlation. It needn't necessarily indicate that the substrate that is highlighted is actually necessary for the function understanding. So the disruptive method will always trump. Now what that means is that lesion maps cannot easily be contradicted. If a lesion map says this area is necessary, then it would be natural to conclude that it overrides anything that could be ascertained by a correlative method. Now this means that it is very hard for anyone to contradict a lesion map because there isn't really any better model. Now this means that yes, if we're correct, that's great, but if we get it wrong, we have very little opportunity to change our position. So what we have to do is to think very carefully about the method itself, because there may be methodological problems here that obscure what is really going on. And so our inference may turn out to be totally distorted. The way to begin consideration of these methodological issues is to think about the ground truth. What is it that we could actually reliably, or just reliably, what could we information theoretically know in the program of ablation deficit mapping. So let's take a synthetic example here. So this is just a matrix of a set of pixels where in the shape of a question mark happens to be the functional substrate, the critical functional substrate for an action. And this is a very simplistic representation of a brain, but for our purposes, it will do. So take this square as being a brain. These are the various parts of the brain, the pixels are parts of the brain. And then what is inside the question mark is the part that is relevant to the function of interest. Now remember that functional substrate is not observed. We don't know what are the areas that are relevant to our function because that is precisely what we're trying to establish. So we now apply a set of lesions that will typically be a large number, say 50 or 100 usually. And um, once we have applied um, those lesions, we then observe the presence or absence of the behavioral deficit dependent on whether or not this unobserved functional substrate is affected by the lesion. So the lesions are observed, we can see them. Here I've simulated them as little ellipsoids. The behavior we can observe, but the underlying functional map has to be inferred. It is not given anywhere. It has to be inferred from the lesions 
and the observed behavior. So there is here no spatial ground truth. There is no mechanism by which you can confirm or infer the map that you have derived, other than the relation between an injury from a lesion and a change in behavior. Now that has profound implications for the nature of the underlying inference. And in particular, it sets up a very important contrast with correlative methods such as function imaging. So if you look at the diagram on the left, we know that behavior is plausibly the outcome a very complex patterns of neural activity subserved by a distributed neural substrate. We're now familiar with the idea that the brain is not a simple Lego-like assembly of units that work in, uh, in any kind of simple, simple combination. We have some complex distributed substrate. That then supports behavior, and it separately, in parallel, also is associated with activation of the brain which we can detect across a set of voxels by registering bold. Now the inference at each of these voxels can then be done independently because they're both severally and separately related to the underlying distributed neural substrate. Now with lesion deficit mapping, which is schematized on the right, we have a very different chain of causation. Here, the entire lesion, not any single part of the lesion, the lesion as a whole, interacts with the distributed neural substrate and gives rise to a deficit. So the causal signal here is distributed across each of these affected voxels, in fact, every voxel across the brain, to produce the deficit. And therefore, in order for us to be able to parcel out the marginal contribution of each individual area of the brain, we have to understand their conjunction, their totality as a whole. And so an approach, the approach, the mass univariate approach that is universal, almost universal across functional imaging and also polymetric brain morphometry until, until relatively recently, does not work here because one has to model the relation between voxels much more flexibly than is possible within mass univariate inference. So let me give you a synthetic illustration of the consequence of these issues. So here we have our ground truth, as specified a moment ago. So the critical voxels are within the question mark, the other voxels are not important. We're now simulating a set of lesions that are little ellipsoids that can be big on the left or small on the right. Here is the lesion distribution. So I can't remember exactly how many I simulated here. I think it was several hundred. Um, but we have a lesion distribution here on the left. This is for the large lesions. And here's the distribution for the small lesions. They look more or less the same. However, when it comes to the inference, you now get very different kinds of images being retrieved. So, the way we've done the inference here, by the way, is with a standard mass univariate test. It's Fisher's exact test, but it doesn't matter what you use. The point is that where the lesion is large, your ability to distinguish between different parts of the underlying ground truth is obviously going to be proportionately weaker. So all you get is the blob. And it is, moreover, a blob that's heavily weighted towards an area of the ground truth where the configuration is such as to make it easy to distinguish from the neighboring areas. Note also that the peak of activation is actually the middle of the question mark, an area that actually is not essential in the synthetic model here to the, um, to the deficit. So actually you can see that this inference is erroneous. Now, if the lesions are very small, then you get a much better approximation to the underlying ground truth. But the point here is that there is a clear relationship between the properties of the lesions and your ability to extract an unbiased, accurate, high fidelity map of the underlying lesion deficit relation. So what happens when we not only change the size of the lesions, but we now play with their morphology? So we change the shape of the lesion dependent on where it is located within our simple matrix. 
this simulates what happens naturally in the brain, certainly when one uses ischemic lesions, where dependent on where you are in the brain, you will have a different pattern of disturbed vasculature giving rise to the lesion, and therefore the shape, the size, the shape, the orientation, the properties of the lesions will differ across an atom. So here we have a biased lesion distribution where the lesions change in their orientation across the field, and here we have unbiased lesions on the right. So when you apply mass univariate inference, SPM style analysis, with the unbiased lesions, you don't do too badly, but with the biased ones, you get completely the wrong picture. So now you can see somebody will conclude that the most important part of um, the overall map is uh, towards the apex of this structure, whereas in fact, it's far more widely distributed. Now, you might say, fine, but you're just playing around with little ellipses in MATLAB. What significance does this have for the brain? Well, we can, of course, look at the distribution of lesions, and we can ask ourselves, are these distributions simple or complex? So here is a real world um, quantification of the diversity of lesion patterns that you see in, uh, in actual clinical practice. So what we've got here in this map, I'm sorry, so faint, is a set of, I think it was about 700 or so lesions of patients with intracerebral hemorrhage. If we zoom in, I wonder if this will work. And then you can see that they're represented as maximum intensity projections from the side. And the way they have been embedded in two dimensional spaces by using the nonlinear dimensionality reduction, this is TSNI, so that we can then preserve similarities and differences across individual types of lesions. So here, this little cluster, these are all cerebellar lesions. Here you've got some cortical lesions that are kind of frontal parietal. And then if we move down, uh, this big cluster here is the usual deep hemorrhages that you get, one of the most dominant patterns of damage and so on. So the critical point here is that there is a diversity of morphologies that are observed across natural lesions that is neither completely random, nor is it simple enough to be segregated into different classes that you could examine separately. Instead, there is a complex clustered high dimensional multivariate distribution. And so the, these complex patterns are bound to interact with the underlying functional map and will generate effects, biasing effects of the kind that I've just simulated with the question mark example. Moreover, we can do exactly the same analysis. Now, instead of using these synthetic lesions, using actual lesions, this is from a study from a few years ago where we took um, about 600 ischemic lesions and now we simulated the ground truth much more simply than the question mark. We say, let's imagine that a given voxel anywhere in the brain is the critical one. Let's now imagine that a, dis a disease, a deficit of some kind is related to that locus. And we then run a lesion, lesion deficit model with mass universe inference in the usual way. So what we then get is a vector map that points from the actual location of the causal voxel to the location that's inferred in the lesion deficit map. And it produces this. So you will see these are just snapshots. We did, of course, a whole brain analysis. You will see that there is a massive distortion of the inferred, inferred localization that follows the pattern of the vascular tree. So this big segment here that's all focused in towards the insula is the MCA territory. At the front, you see ACA, and elsewhere, the more complex patterns related to some divisions of the vasculature. So we can see that with single voxel hypothetical ground truths, we can show that there is a very complex pattern of distortion that emerges um, when real lesions are applied. So this effect is not fanciful. This effect is real. 
Now, what happens if we move to a more structured, a more plausible pattern of, um, of lesion deficit relations? So instead of having a single voxel as being critical, model as being critical for a deficit, we have an entire region of interest. And here we chose BA44 or BA39, so here one or the other, damage to one or the other, as being causal of a disorder. What would then be the inferred area um, uh, of, of criticality? And what we get is a cluster that does to some extent highlight voxels within the two regions, but is actually mostly centered on superior temporal gyrus. And so we can see that if we were to apply mass univariate methods to a problem where the underlying dependence is distributed in this complex way, we end up with inference that's miles off from where we need to be. So, is there a solution? Should we just abandon the technique and go, oh, that's one option, certainly, and some have argued for it. Some have said that, well, that simply demonstrate the lesion deficit mapping doesn't work, and we should go back to function energy. But no, we don't have to be that pessimistic. It is possible to make things better. What we must do we, is we must find a way of learning the lesion um, distribution so that we can then disentangle that from the underlying functional organization. Essentially, what we need is a high dimensional multivariate method that absorbs the variability in the patterns of lesions, that models the covariance of damage across the brain, and then isolates the specific contribution of the um, underlying substrate based on the functional dependence rather than the patterns of damage. And here we have at the bottom a reanalysis of the synthetic question mark model that I showed you earlier. And you can see this is actually done with a fairly simple, simple boosted trees method. And we can see that it extracts the question mark much better than the univariate method, and in particular, performed much better where the distribution of lesion is biased. We can also show the same thing with real lesion data. Here, the same BA44, BA39 problem has been reanalyzed in the support vector machine. This is actually a linear support vector machine. And we can see that you have a reasonable, um, a much better differentiation between those two regions. And we no longer have so many voxels spilling into STG. So now let's move on to the topic of the talk, which is how one might be tempted to misuse these sorts of in silico models in tackling the fundamental problems of lesion deficit mapping. The first thing to say is that it is very tempting to try to stick to a particular method simply because one is familiar with it or because it facilitates one's ability to publish all the various other things that pressure our lives. And one thing we must always keep in mind that if the assumptions of a statistical test are violated, it can no longer be used. It's neither true nor false, it's just nonsense. And what is really disturbingly prevalent across the field is people insisting on using approaches that are simply invalid because they're um, presuppositional assumptions are broke. So if a particular inferential method, as SPM does, as the SPM star of inference does, is reliant on the underlying substrate having a particular structure, and if that structure is shown to be different, then we can no longer apply it. And it's not a question that we can overturn by the use of simulations or anything else. It's a conceptual question, it's a given we cannot change the rules of mathematics, and so we should just stop and do something else. So paying attention to what is licit, what is mathematically licit, is the first thing we have to do. The second thing we have to think about is that there are certain kinds of moves here that uh, information theoretically prescribe. It's not possible for a pattern that is highly complex to be accounted for by something that is very simple. One cannot um, somehow um, 
cause a complex form of organization to be explained by something very simple, where it is not reducible to anything simple. So the critical example here is the use of lesion volume as a covariant, as a means of adjusting a standard mass univariate map. And this is something that's been argued for, for decades, and it is something that people keep insisting on even now. And let me show you why that makes no sense. What you're seeing here in the picture in the middle is similar slices to what, in fact, identical slices to the plots I showed you earlier. But what we've, now, we've done here is to compute the odds ratio of a logistic regression model that has as its target whether or not a voxel is lesioned. And here the weighting is on the lesion volume. So we can see that certain areas of the brain are associated with much larger lesion volumes than other areas. And there is a complex pattern across the brain of such dependence. Unsurprisingly, the areas that are associated with larger lesions tend to be areas that sit at the intersections between vascular tetras. And so in order for that part of the brain to be hit by a vascular lesion, the lesion has to be quite big. Now this means that if you add lesion volume as a covariant to your model, you will end up distorting the inference in a way that's dependent on this map. And so you cannot, information theoretically cannot correct what you've produced because you've effectively injected a further highly complex bias into your map. And so it doesn't matter what your simulation shows, it cannot work simply because the complexity is there and cannot be absorbed by any simple scalar value. The third um, element to think about is the interpretation of the results of any simulation. It's quite tempting to say, okay, well, the simulation demonstrates a certain mean error, let's say 15 mils or so per voxel. Now I've introduced some kind of, some kind of trick, let's say it's, uh, it's correction for lesion volume or something of that kind. Um, and um, it, you know, it's now come down to 14 millimeters or whatever. But the fact that this might be statistically significantly different from the preceding value doesn't mean that the method is now suddenly okay. Because 15 millimeters may be better than 16 millimeters, but it's still miles when it comes to localization in the brain. So what we care about here is the actual distribution of the magnitude of the spatial error, not whether or not there's a significant difference between one kind of adjustment and another. That is what matters. And what we need to think about is, is the degree of distortion that we've observed acceptable or not when it comes to localization. Trivial differences, especially when they're amplified by the use of, of bootstraps or you know, other ways of, of shrinking, unreasonably shrinking down the p-value, is not the right way to do it. Next, it's also tempting to try and play with the lesions or with the terrain, the um, uh, essentially the boundaries of the brain over which the inference is made, so that one can then reduce the error. Now, one way of doing that, for example, is to prune model voxels at some kind of proportional cutoff. Now, if you do that, let's say 5%, so you only model areas of the brain that have been hit in 5% of lesions or more. Now, the problem is that that artificially improves the mean error rate because, of course, the rarer a voxel is, the more often it tends to be distorted, simply because there's high variance there, but also because rarer voxels tend to be associated with bigger lesions. But what happens when you prune based on rarity or some other spatially uh, varying feature of damage, you're, you're bound to end up with an interaction with lesion anatomy, and so you're injecting bias. And so even if your synthetic model happens to be better, the real world application of that approach cannot be better because you've essentially, you've, you've, what you've done is to artificially uh, constrain the simulated model 
in a way that limits its applicability to the real world. And so if you like, the solution is a, is a false one. Another temptation is to say, all right, well, you've shown us this beautiful error map where each voxel is misplaced in a particular direction by a particular amount. Fine, why don't we just take that map and just invert it? And then suddenly we're back to where we need to be. No, that doesn't work. And the reason it does not work is because when you invert that map, what you're doing is you're inverting the error that is generated by the specific ground truth that happens to have been chosen for that specific model. And so the spatial pattern, the underlying spatial pattern, may well be different where the underlying fusion deficit relation is different from that. Now, by definition, we do not know what the underlying fusion deficit relation is, and so we cannot presuppose it. And so it's not possible to do any kind of inversion of this kind. This is essentially question begging in the proper sense of the term. It's also not possible to say, okay, well, um, this corrective method that I've conceived happens to work with single voxel dependence models. That means that it's bound to improve the situation with more complex models. I don't even need to model those. Again, no. Any simulation is specific to the ground truth that is employed in it. And the reason we start off with simple models is because that gives us a lower bound. Essentially, this is about as bad as the situation can be. And whenever a complex model, a more complex model of the underlying relation is introduced, there's always the possibility that the error will be much, much higher. So for one to have any confidence in how well a particular method works, one needs to move across a set of fusion deficit relations, beginning with simple, because if the simple one is bad, the complex one is not going to be better, and then moving on to more complex models um, as, as the simpler ones are shown to have been adequately solved. But one cannot generalize from simple to complex without specifically exploring the more complex models as well. It's also crucial to understand um, the nature of, of any architectural comparisons. The fact that your particular misconceived, badly implemented multivariate model is as bad as mass univariate inference does not mean that all multivariate inference is bad, or that there is no point in pursuing multivariate methods. All that you can do in comparing architectures is to say, well, this particular architecture works, or this particular architecture doesn't. And there's plenty of reasons other than the general methodological approach that might make a particular uh, model fail. Note that the objections to mass univariate analysis that um, I've mentioned um, are not ones that can be overcome by any simulation. So the issue with mass univariate analysis is a foundational one, it's a conceptual, it's a mathematical issue. So it's not changed by simulation. The purpose of simulations here is to select the right kind of modeling architecture, assuming that the multivariate um, approach is the correct one. And then, um, that's finally, there is always a tendency for us to demand some kind of PMAP, some kind of significant threshold that's spatial map, where we can say, oh, these areas are, are, are critical and the rest are not. What we have moved to here is a, is a very different uh, form of inference. So what we're doing really is high dimensional model comparison. We're saying, of the methods of the models in front of us, this one appears to fit uh, the data best. We're not in a position anymore to reject any kind of null hypothesis because the space of hypothetical possibilities by definition becomes vast the moment we move within a, a high dimensional multivariate framework. And so there is, there can be no, no talk of p bias here. The situation is analogous to the problem of looking at the feature activation maps of complex models in machine vision, for example, illustrated in this um, 
simple um, uh, diagram from um, uh, from a, a recent model for optimizing CNNs, efficient networks. So what you can see on the left here is the original image, and then these are the uh, activation maps. These are essentially maps of what parts of the image the model is paying attention to in making its um, classification uh, of what the image is. And you can see that the features it highlights tend to be different across models. These models might have comparable performance on the task of classification, but the parts of the image that they impute as being inferentially important vary dependent on the model. And it so happens that this model on the right here does a very good job. It seems to be paying attention to the right things, but it isn't something that one can quantify in a way that uh, gives you formal inference of the kind that we're accustomed to in the context of functional imaging BBM. And we should not even try. So to conclude then, what are the fundamental principles in how we approach in silico simulations in, in region deficit modeling? Well, we can and we should use it for the following uh, purposes. Firstly, we should use it to demonstrate errors in our illusion deficit maps, but not to correct them. We cannot use a model that we can then take in order to apply to real world data and say, okay, well, we can apply some kind of correction based on that model. It doesn't work that way. We should use such models to survey performance across an array of plausible ground truths, but not then to prescribe that across real lesion relations, because all that we can do within our survey is to make comparisons across sets of different architectures and sets of different ground truths. It's not something that guarantees any kind of extrapolation to the real world. Third, we should use it to inform the design of models that are statistically valid. But we cannot use it in order to conceal deficits of invalid statistics that are there a priori. They're not in any way empirical. They're there simply because the statistics do not make sense. And so it's pointless to run any simulations where the statistics are merely, um, they're essentially not applicable. We should also use um, these approaches, uh, or these um, in silico models to optimize both the representations of lesions and of functions in the brain, but not in such a way as to distort them so that they then fit into inferential frameworks that are not applicable. It doesn't help us to constrain lesions, to distort lesions so that they fit in. What we have to do is we need to change our models so that they're appropriately um, applicable to the particular task at hand. And then finally, it is very helpful to use simulations in order to enlighten ourselves of the difficulty of our task, and in particular, to make sure that we're not led down the wrong path to methods that might produce lots of very attractive p-values, but in the end, don't really mean anything. So I think I'll pause there and perhaps there may be some questions. Uh, thank you very much for your, for your talk. It was very interesting. I'm sure we're all bursting at the seams with questions. I know that I have some and that we were receiving some from some listeners um, during your talk. Uh, so the first question that I have is, in considering uh, the misuses that you just presented, is there a way, um, is there an easy way to find out if the analysis is false? So if you apply this method, is there a way of knowing that actually it's not correct or I shouldn't have used this method? Yes, so I think there, there are two standards to apply. The first is, is the conceptual one, the mathematical one. So if the foundational assumptions of a particular approach, particular modeling approach are broken, then any inference based on it is insecure. So the moment you identify that there is if you like an algebraic, what amounts to a mathematical error, then all bets are off and we cannot trust the inferred map. The second way is empirical. 
to look at um, the relationship between um, what is spatially inferred and actually what happens to the patient in terms of being able to predict whether or not the patient has the deficit out of sample. So now what we're talking about is not spatial inference, we're talking about prediction. But if a model ends up, a spatial model, ends up being very poorly predictive, then that suggests that the underlying map is probably not accurate. Now, of course, outcomes in patients are affected by a wide array of factors of which the anatomy of the lesion might be just one. There may be all sorts of unmodeled, there will be all sorts of unmodeled factors that will have a bearing on the outcome. And so you would not expect the predictive model to be perfect. But if that model is bad, or if another model is better, then that means that the inference is unlikely to be accurate. And so when it comes to model comparison, our ultimate measure will always be how well we can predict specific individuals out of sample. So that's, that actually brings us to a very important point, which is what is the relation between prediction and inference here? So these are predictive models in the sense that they're trained on the outcome. And so ultimately they're models of what happens to a patient given the lesion. What we're taking from that model is an inference as to the significance of specific parts of the anatomy. But ultimately, the goodness of the model is measured by, by how well it predicts the outcome. And provided your prediction is out of sample, so you can be reasonably guaranteed that it's not an overfit, then that is your best guide. This means that if you come up with some very complex nonlinear model where, you know, the, if you like, the the internals of the model are too complex to be able to visualize as a nice statistical map. And if that model generalizes well and works much better than, uh, than a simple model, then all that tells you is that there is a spatial inference to be made, but that inference is not simple. It cannot be displayed on a 3D map. It has to be given in a more complex way, perhaps as a graph of the relations between different uh, parts of the brain. Thank you so much. I do invite all of our listeners to, if you have any questions, please feel free to, to raise your hand or to, to write directly into the chat. Into the, the chat, And then I'd be happy to ask a question for you or you can ask it yourself, however you'd like to go. Uh, in terms of, I do have some additional questions. So in terms of, um, uh, is there any way I know that you've mentioned uh, how it should not how it should be applied in the best ways it should be applied, but is there any way of knowing prior to applying the model without actually looking at the results. Uh, is there a way of knowing prior to which model is the or which method is the best to apply. Well, um, other than that, it needs to have sufficient expressivity. So as I say, something that's that's way, way, way too simple is not going to work when there's all these complex patterns there. Mm -hmm. So the complexity of a model has to be commensurate with the complexity of the problem. If there's a mismatch between them, it's not going to work. So given that lesions are as complex as they are in, in their morphology, as I showed you with the hemorrhage map, what that tells you is that assuming that they're Gaussian blobs is not going to work, can't work. And so some models one can just dismiss a priori just because they're not sufficiently expressive, they're not flexible. And that is essentially the argument against mass univariate inference. It just doesn't have the expressivity needed to learn those complex covariances. And so it's all going to be wrong. But the reason we're doing these analyses um, is because sometimes when it comes to more complex architectures where they're, you know, they're, they're all reasonable candidates, we don't know which one's going to work better we need to see, using synthetic ground truths, which one appears to be the best, and then we go with that. Um, and it's um, exactly, exactly analogous to the way that we, you know, the way that uh, machine vision guides, for example, optimize image classification models in, in other contexts. Hi there, Etta. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, please, Etta, please. Hi. Thanks. Good, thanks. How are you? Good. Sorry. <laughs> Let's cut her mic. 
Um, so additional questions uh, that we also have is um, in the absence of a foolproof method, method for the mapping of the lesions, especially if we don't know the ground truth, uh, do you think, um, what do you think is the best lesion deficient mapping method? Um, or do you think that the in silico lesion deficient method, uh, method of mapping is the best alternative that we have on offer? Or do you think the, like which model do you think is the, the best to apply basically? Yes, so it's, it's difficult. I think we're at the stage at the moment of still learning how to do multivariate lesion deficit mapping. It's too early to say it's got to be this, it's got to be that. The mm -hmm. answer I just don't know. So we're exploring a number of, of different approaches um, and which will turn out to be best suited to lesion data, I think is a question on which the jury is still out. I think the problem is that we're very far still from the optimal or even an adequate number of available lesions for doing lesion deficit inference with multivariate methods. And so any comparisons that we make between architectures end up being limited by the quantity of available data mm -hmm. rather than by the features of the model itself. There just isn't enough data there. If you think about it intuitively, imagine that you take the brain and then you say you have 100 lesions and you parcelate it into um, 10 regions of interest, say, in a way that maximizes the, uh, uh, the uniformity of the distribution of the underlying regions, even if you could do that, and that's super hard. Well, you only have 10 in each bin. That's the number you have, which is tiny when it comes to any kind of or comparison. So even 100 patients, which is a pretty decent number for most lesion studies, most people struggle to get into three figures, um, uh, it is actually uh, very hard to analyze, even if you were only to have 10 bins. So I hesitate making any recommendations about specific architectural solutions, because I don't think we uh, yet at the point at which we can make them. Um, I think we need a lot more lesions, we need lots and lots of simulations, we need lots of principal comparison between different methods, and only then we will know. Thank you. Let's go to one of our listeners who has a question. Chris, please go ahead. Hey. Um, yeah, so well, it's linked to uh, the, this question. So uh, what do you think would be the, the limit of the amount of data to start doing mass multivariate analysis? Or how could we evaluate if we have enough data or not? Yes, so, so I think, yes, I, I go back, I suppose, to, to the only measure we can have here, because it's the only one for which we have a ground truth, and that is predictive power. Uh, and so I think the point at which we can build models that are sensitive and specific out of sample, um, you know, that, that work very well in predicting outcomes, I think is the point at which we can start trust, start trusting the, uh, the features on which they depend. Um, so I think what we need to do is we need to see what the relationship is between number of input data and the fidelity of a predictive model, see where that is starting to saturate, see what ceiling we achieve with that, and only then think about whether or not those features can be interpreted. So I think the problem needs to be approached from prediction, not from inference. So this is where you know, my perspective, I think, tends to differ from, from the field. It seems to me that Prediction is the primary problem here. We need to begin with prediction, and only once our predictive models are as good as we can get them can we address inference. Everybody thinks that prediction is a you know, pedestrian, you know, intellectually negligible task, something that you know, less enlightened beings do, whereas you know, we should all be doing inference because you know, that, is, that is what neuroscience is supposed to be about. No, it can't be. Impossible. It's no more possible than inference can be the task in meteorology. You know? So only once you've got a good predictive model, can you start thinking about inference. Thank you. Let's go to our next listener. Uh, Michelle, please go ahead. Hey, 
How are you doing? Yeah. Uh, so I had this question. It's a bit related to what has been asked before. Um, but you just left me terribly sad in terms of predicting symptoms in patients and their potential recovery. Um, so most of the bias, and the way I interpret it, I, I felt was like related to the localization of the function with lesions. And there is also some bias with the relationship with clinical symptoms. And you've been working so hard in, in terms of like trying to find way to disentangle those bias from lesions. I was wondering whether, you know, you think it would be possible in the future to predict symptoms based on the lesion, the visible lesion, or uh, we should just give up. Um, if you think it's possible, do you think you'll be able to produce one day uh, software that help people with smaller number of lesions to make those predictions? Well, uh, Sorry. Yes, yeah, so there's two questions. First, well, the first question is I certainly hope so. Um, mm -hmm. because my entire research program is based on the answer to your first question being yes. Um, I'm sure we can, I'm sure we can. I mean, it's an asymptotic problem, right? It's never gonna be perfect. It's always, always going to be imperfect, but I think we can do a lot better than what we do, what we do currently, which is simply to guess. In mm -hmm. practice, we have no formal models, formal predictive models. We just look at the lesion and we go, oh, I think that's a bit bad, but we, we are doing better than that. So we can definitely improve. Second question is, can we, find a way of being able to make inferences with smaller numbers of patients. Mm -hmm. I also have the answer to that question is yes. I think the way to do that is through transfer learning. So essentially what we do is we try, try to draw as much intelligence as we can from data that we have available at large scale. And then we um, use that as a kind of inductive bias within more structured um, essentially um, prior leader models that can then extract um, with greater efficiency patterns from, from smaller populations. It is a supremely important problem because there are many diseases where, I mean, even within stroke, you know, there are patterns of damage that are so rare, you're never going to have more than 100 you know, within a specific pattern. And what do you do with these patients? You can never say to a patient, mate, I'm sorry, you're too rare, you know? Um, so we always, always, always have to be able to um, operate in low data regimes. And the way that I, I think it will be solved is, as I say, trying to, to, to um, extract as much as we can from large scale data and then find models that can degrade gracefully as the quantity of input data goes down. So essentially they become um, less certain that they don't break down. They simply say, I don't know, which is what clinicians do. You know, if I see a unique patient that's never been described in literature, nothing's happened, well, that's what we say, we don't know, right? we don't know. So your variances blow up, but it still works. Okay. Uh, the next listener, uh, Patrick, please. Uh, hi, um, great talk, really loved it. Um, regarding the quote unquote best model for predicting, let's say, deficits in participants or in patients, isn't it possible to assume that the, the best model is always conditional, meaning that it actually depends on the type of deficit that we're looking at. Um, because for instance, I, I might just assume that for some functions such as auditory, um, um, very basic auditory or sensory functions, um, things like neuroid density um, or, um, or other local properties might be of more interest um, with regards to the underlying neural substrate, then, for instance, their long-range connectivity to other regions. And absolutely, absolutely. Everything here is premised on the signal being neuroanatomically detectable, of course. So it may well be that a particular function 
happens to be subserved in a highly variable way across individuals, you're going to have a very, very hard time learning that just because there's so much variability. Equally, then maybe there's a particular function that has um, you know, a highly diffuse um, correlate, so it's effectively distributed across the whole brain. You know, there again, mapping is not going to work. I mean, one example might be dizziness, for example. Let's imagine that this is a symptom of this is not a function, but let's imagine you wanted to map dizziness. Yes, you might get vestibular images, but you might also find that you get the whole of the brain because dizziness is the outcome of there being a mismatch across an array of sensory modalities that is detected by the brain as something is wrong. And so it's a fundamentally distributed symptom in its, in its um, neural support. So I agree, it's an empirical question whether or not you can derive any map in a particular deficit. And, and again, I would fall back to prediction. So if spatial information can predict outcome, if you can fit a model well, if that model is predictive on a sample, then you'll be able to trust its anatomical learning. If you don't, if you're capturing like 10% of variance, then just forget it and move on. We have also a question from a YouTube listener, uh, Joanne, who asks that this may not be completely related to the top topic, but are you aware if lesion symptom mapping has been used in patients with post-stroke psychosis to identify neural substrates of psychosis? The answer is I don't know. Sounds like a very interesting question, but uh, I don't know. I think it might be hard to get sufficient numbers um, that um, because it is a relatively rare phenomenon, but uh, I don't. Okay, um, feel free if anyone has any further questions, feel free to use the chat box. Um, I have two or three additional questions for you, which more of how you feel about things. Uh, given recent debates on the utility of fMRI, do you feel that fMRI is still useful in clinical and research applications? Um, well, yeah. I have to say, I think um, one cannot ignore the, the patterns that one um, sees from functional imaging are distinct, they're task specific, um, they're wonderfully elaborate, they're interesting, there's no question. I think it would be mistaken to attempt to assume, which it's very easy to do, that because an error happens to be highlighted, that then tells us something about how the brain actually does the function um, that is uh, associated with it. Because of course you never know that that activation isn't just epiphenomenal to what's really going on. But nonetheless, those patterns cannot be ignored. And I think the right way to use correlated data of this kind is as a kind of regularizer, if you like, an additional piece of information that one then incorporates into models that are inferentially strong, such as fusion deficit models. So I don't think we can build models of the working brain on functional imaging alone, but it's certainly a useful um, tool, still a useful tool in informing disruptive models in the right way. Um, and uh, what do you feel are the biggest challenges right now uh, in lesion mapping? I think it's actually mostly a, a, a community social one. I just, um, I have to say, I often despair um, with the persistence of, with methods that are clearly ill suited to the task. And there is just so much discussion around what are really statistical trivia, when the real problems lie elsewhere, that these are not, this isn't simple, you know, this is not something one can solve with simple methods. So a great deal of energy is expended in the wrong direction. And given how important lesion deficit mapping is, it is, I think, unquestionably the only method that we have that gives us strong inferential power across the whole of the brain. It's the only disruptive method that can reach um, every possible part of the brain. So we have a huge burden 
to deliver the best possible models. And we can only do that if we focus on what we need to do here, which is to apply the right methods in the right way. It's also important because the approach to data collection, to data acquisition, to modeling in general, is radically changed by a shift to multivariate methods. It means that we cannot do studies with 20, 30, 40 patients. We have to pool data on a far, far bigger scale, which means thousands. And so we should be thinking more about collaborative studies where you know large scale um, experiments are, are deployed necessarily across continents because that's the only way we're going to go at scale um, and you know we move to a, a very different way to approaching the field i think the faster we got we get to that point the better because we're not going to go any further if we continue as we are mm. We have another question from a listener, uh, YouTube listener, uh, Maria, who asks, the vector plot of mislocalization of single voxels with a mass un univariate analysis that you showed here from the Ma et al. paper has highlighted limitations of the original univariate models. Do you have similar plot for one of the current, currently available multivariate models? As I'm still wondering to what extent the multivariate models are able to address or not these lesion anatomical biases that play univariate analyses. So we haven't redone that study with uh, a multivariate method. Um, we did, of course, do a comparison within the region of interest um, simulation in, in the MyTal paper. Um, but we haven't done it at scale yet. Um, um, across the single voxel analysis, mostly because I suppose that was that was really designed as an illustration of the problem. The single voxel ground truth, of course, is not biologically plausible. It was merely to show how the bias arises from the underlying vasculature. We are in the process um, of um, running um, an array of more complex models and trying an array of different architectures. We haven't yet done it because we want to have the necessary scale of available lesions. And although you know we, we were able to publish our latest paper had 1300 or so, we would really like to play with about 5000 before we, we release a, um, a, a simulation, just because we don't want to be handicapped by a number of available lesions. So yes, something will be uh, released at some point, but not quite yet. Thank you very much. And just to wrap things up, I have one final question because we do have a lot of students and young researchers and clinicians who, who do follow and who are listening. Do you have any suggestions for students and young researchers and clinicians wishing to work on lesions? Do you have any advice or suggestions that may be helpful for them, either career-wise or research-wise? So the first thing to say is that they need to be comfortable with multivariate modeling uh, and they need to be in love with computers um, because if they're not, their lives will be hell. Um, that's just the reality of it because they'll be spending most of their lives sitting in front of one doing lots of complex modeling. It is in the nature of the task, as I've argued, that it's computationally very complex, it's very heavy, it's not easy to understand. Um, and of course, much of the terrain of multivariate modeling is still unsettled. So I would say is you have to have the right kind of digital stomach for it, so to speak. Um, otherwise you'll find it a frustrating experience. But, but having said that, it does seem to be the most important task in system neuroscience, because of course we all want to find the relation between patterns of function in the brain and outcome, because it is precisely in relation to lesions and other forms of modifiable damage to the brain that we can intervene, that we can actually change outcomes. And certainly for clinicians, the focus is always, what can I do for the patient in front of me? And the surest, the fastest, the most direct route to understanding that is by going through entrenching strong techniques such as lesion deficit mapping. 
So yes, it's painful, yes, it's uncomfortable, but it must be done. And the more of us that uh, by ourselves do the task, the better. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time, uh, Dr. Prashkov-Nachev. And thank you very much for all everyone who came and listened. Uh, please join us on the 22nd of December for the screening of the, the movie Fifth Dementia. And we're looking forward to um, having everyone and talking to you again. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone.